Let us pray. Our Father, we bless your name because of this first Bible study session this year. We praise you because of the revelation in the scriptures. And we know that these studies in the Bible are supposed to make us strong, to make us keep alive as a church and as a Christian body. And we are praying that this day, your word will be very made, will be made very plain and clear to every one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. And you will show us the very path of duty. And our responsibilities will be made clear then we will live lives that are above reproach, that will bring glory to your name, and that will lead others to the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, open the scriptures to us today, and let our hearts rejoice at the discovery of the great and mighty truths in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Every Monday we meet for Bible study and we have a systematic study of whatever part of the Bible we're studying. Now the part of the Bible we're studying this present time is Acts of the Apostles. And tonight we're looking at Acts chapter 2, verses 41 to 47. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together, and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God, and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. I want you to pay particular attention to the very last part I have read, which is verse 47. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. That makes us call that first church a growing church. And I want to show you from Acts of the Apostles why we have called the first church a growing church. Already you have seen this verse, the Lord added to the church every day as people were getting saved, getting forgiven, having eternal life, having the names in the book of life and they were having the peace of God. The Lord was adding to the visible church on the face of the earth. In chapter 5, verse 28, saying, Did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name. Behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. That's a growing church, filling the whole capital city of the Israelites with the doctrine of Christ. In chapter 6, verse 7, And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem, Greatly, You notice the language? The number of disciples in Jerusalem multiplied greatly. That's not all. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Chapter 8, verse 6. And the people, with one accord, 
gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. In verse 8, and there was great joy in that city. Chapter 9, verse 31. Then are the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, they were multiplied. In chapter 11, verse 21, and the hand of the Lord was with them. Notice what follows. And a great number, a great number believed, and they turned unto the Lord. In verse 24, for he was a good man, talking about Barnabas. He was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. Notice what follows. And much people, and much people was added unto the Lord. Chapter 13, verse 48. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and they glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained unto eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. In chapter 16, verse 5. And so, were the churches established in the faith, and they increased in number daily. Somebody was there counting, and the record is, the report is, they increased in number daily. In chapter 17, verse 6. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. These that have turned the world upside down have come here also. So that is why we have called this first church that we're studying about tonight a growing church. And I want to tell you tonight the secrets of a growing church. If uh, any church wants to pattern after the first century church, after the church of the New Testament, after the church that received the Holy Ghost, and you want to be after that church, pattern yourself after that church, then that means you want to be a growing church. But what does it mean for a church to grow? That means they'll grow spiritually. They'll grow in their relationship together. They'll grow in number as well. And the word of the Lord is very clear. When a church is growing, disciples are added to that church. The word of God is very clear. When the church is growing, in fact, the number of disciples will be multiplied. And now we're seeing the secrets of a growing church. And I show you 10 definite identifications of a growing church. Number one, it's a saved church. You know, it's not just a society, it's not a club, it's not a company, it's not a community. It's a saved church. The people that are coming into that church, they're hearing the word of God, they're repenting of their sins, and they're becoming saved, and only those that are saved are being added to that church. Number two, it's a separated church. Because you see, they could be numbered separately from the people in the community. It's saved, it's separated, then it's steadfast. You see, while people are coming in through the front door and people are going out or backsliding through the back door, there'll be no growth. But a growing church is a church that has securely locked the back door. People are coming in, but nobody's going out. That's a steadfast church. Then it's a studying church. Surrender to the word of God they are studying because they are not just having a mental ascent of what they are studying as they study. They receive that word of God and they surrender to the teaching of the word of God. They submit to the examples, biblical examples that they see. And then it's a sharing church. That means they are able to have communion and fellowship together. They love one another. They share doctrine and they share fellowship and love. Because Jesus said, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye love one another. 
They're able to share their problems and their joys and their sorrows. They're able to share their faith together. They're able to share even their possession together. And then it's a supplicating church. A church totally depending upon God. And therefore, the arm of prayer is strengthened. They are praying, they are making supplication unto the Lord. But then it's a spirit-filled and spirit-controlled church. The spirit is not just dragged along to just, you know, sanction their programs and projects. But they are being led and filled and controlled by the Holy Spirit. And because the spirit-filled and spirit-controlled church, because of that, it's a growing church. And then it's a signs-following church. That means what Jesus said, that signs, miracles, and wonders will follow them. In a growing church, that will be taking place. The Lord will be confirming the word they are preaching with signs and wonders. And then it's a soul-winning church. Where these ten items are present in any church, I guarantee you, that church will be patterned after the New Testament, and that church will grow. Now let's get started. A saved church in Acts chapter 2 again. Verse 41, Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Then they that gladly received this word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Join that with verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved pick up that word for a moment the word the last word of verse 47 saved what does it mean well you know what it means when somebody says i was an, in an accident but god saved me in that accident that means he should have died but he did not die you know what it means when somebody says well i, I was in a burning house but you know, God saved me from that burning house. That means the house got burnt, but he, as an individual, escaped the burning. He was not burnt. You know what happens, uh, you know, when somebody is, uh, when many people have been retrenched in a place of work, and somebody came out to say, you know, the Lord saved me from the retrenchment exercise. That means... It affected everybody else, but I was spared. I was delivered. While it's the same thing when, you know, the Bible says you are saved. It's only at this time you are not being saved from accident. You are not being saved from a burning house. You are not being saved from retrenchment. You are being saved from, listen to me, eternal burning. Because you see, every sinner that dies in sin will burn eternally under the judgment of God. To be saved means that you have got to make friends with the judge. And before the judge comes on the bench to judge you and to tell you that you are condemned forever, already you have got his son on your side and his son suffered for you and you have brought his son Jesus Christ before him before the judge and you're saying I do not want to pass through the judgment forgive me have mercy upon my soul and the great judge because of his son because his son died for you he'll say all right I will not judge you anymore you have escaped hellfire the penalty of sin the punishment of sin that means you are saved or oh, you know what it means when, you know, many people are carrying a burden of guilt. They're carrying their condemnation. But then you find a burden bearer that saves you from the load of sin, from the heavy guilt upon your heart. How did that happen? You went to the cross of Calvary by faith. You called upon God. You said, oh God, save my soul. Have mercy upon me. And that load, innumerable sins you have committed before, everything is removed. What do you say then? You say, I am saved from the load of my sin. You know, when an enemy has captured you, and you know, he has put you in a cage, and he's waiting for the time when, number one, he'll steal all your property away. Number two, he'll destroy everything you had, desire, everything that was your treasure. And then at last, he'll kill you. And somebody, just before you were killed, just came and delivered you from the hand of that enemy. What do you say? You say, I was saved from sudden death. You know, the devil is an enemy. 
and he has captured every sinner. And that enemy wants to steal everything that brings joy to you. He wants to kill you and to destroy you. But you know when you're wrong, to the deliverer, to the savior, Jesus Christ, and you tell him, save me, have mercy upon me, forgive me, deliver me from this tyrant, from this adversary, from Satan. Then he translates you from the kingdom of Satan, from the kingdom of darkness, to the kingdom of his dear son. And now you are free. Because if the Son shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. What do you say? You say, I am saved. What does it mean then to be saved? Saved from sin. Saved from the punishment of sin. Saved from the penalty of sin. Saved from the power, the overwhelming power of sin. Saved from the torture of Satan, from the captivity of Satan, and you are brought into the glorious gospel. When that has happened, you are saved. And in that early church, only those who had repented of their sins and they, you know, threw away the guilt and the load and the condemnation of sin, and they were forgiven, washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, and they were saved, only those who were counted as members of the church. And I'm calling upon you if you are not yet saved. If you still feel guilty under the load of sin, if you still feel condemned, you remember I told you the judge will judge on the last day, but you can make friends with his son, the Savior. He'll deliver you and save you so that when you appear before the judgment seat at last, you'll be able to pass from death unto life, from judgment unto liberty because... You are a friend of Jesus, a child of God. Your sins are taken away. And when people are being saved like that, you see, the church will grow. Follow me to First Thessalonians. I'm reading there from chapter 1. First Thessalonians. Chapter 1. Verse 1. Paul and Silvanus, that's another name for Silas, and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God. The church in God, that's a saved church, the Father. And in the Lord Jesus Christ, whosoever is in Christ Jesus is a new creature, that's a saved soul, and it's a saved church. Grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. Why is he giving thanks? Because there were no more sinners, they were saved. Why is he giving thanks? Because their load of sin had been taken away, they were forgiven and delivered from sin. Therefore, he's giving thanks for them all. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. You are chosen of God when you are saved. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake, and ye became followers of us and of the Lord. Stop right there. That means they were saved. And after they were saved, they were no more following the ways of the world. They were no more following the unbelieving heroes of the world, the drunkards of the world, the cheats, the murderers, the criminals of the world. Now they were living clean lives. And they were following the apostles who were teaching them the word of God. Now I've told you that this was a saved church. That's why it's a growing church. Number two. The separated church. Come back to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Let me read verse, back up to verse 40. And with many other words, did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. And they gladly received that word, and they were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. You know, the apostle said when he was teaching and instructing them, he said, save yourself from this unto what generation. He was telling them the generation around them was bad, corrupt, adulterous, worldly, evil. And yet he told them, separate yourself from this wicked generation. You see, when you come to the Lord, 
and you receive the Lord as your personal Savior, you become totally separated. We talk of a separated church when every member, every born-again soul in that place is separated from the world. You know, if out of 1,000 members in a church, only two, three people are separated, you cannot call that church a separated church. But when every member, every believer, everyone that is saved is totally separated from the evil of the world, from the habits of the world, from the system of the world, you call that church a separated church. There is a line of separation, a line of demarcation between that church and the world. Worldliness is ruled out completely. And you see that place I read unto you saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Separate yourself. Come apart. Be separate from the evils of the world around you. In Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world. There you are. You see, if you are saved, your life will be distinct. Your life will be different from the people around you. They lie, you're honest. They are covetous, you are content with what you have. They cheat, but no, you are benevolent and generous. They grab and cheat people and get whatever they can get from them, but on the other hand, you are just having a giving heart, a sharing heart. Your life, your mode of life, your style of living is totally different from the lives of the people around you because you want to lead an honest, upright, righteous, a holy life. And it says if you are part of the growing church, a church that is saved, you then must be separated from the worldliness all around you. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good, an acceptable and perfect will of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, Be ye not unequally yoked together with some believers. Did you hear that? Unbelievers have their mode of life. They have their ways of committing sin. But if you are a child of God, it says, be ye not unequally yoked together with some believers because for the church to grow, you must grow. For you to grow, you must be a saved individual and a separated individual. And if you are part of a growing church, remember, the identification tax of a growing church is that one, it's saved. And two, it's separated. And be ye not unequally yoked together with some believers for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? The answer is none. And what communion has light with darkness? The answer is there is no communion between them. What concord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has he that believers with an infidel, with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? Don't you know ye are the temple of the living God? As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them. Be ye separate, that's the word, on the lineage. You are a new believer, you have just come to the Lord. That is a word that must be very clear in your way of living. Be ye separate. You can no more do what the people of the world are doing. If you are a believer, if you are a child of God, your sins are forgiven. Be ye separate, says the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you and be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. I told you the a growing church is a safe church, it's a separated church, then it's a steadfast church. Steadfast church. That means it's a church standing fast. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And they, who are the day, the 120 and also the 3,000. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. And fellowship, in that place you see, the word steadfast. A growing church is a steadfast church. Now, to be steadfast means to, to be dependable in a way. When the believers are meeting together, you are dependable that you'll be there along with them. 
In Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 7, it tells us the quality of being steadfast. The quality of being steadfast. And if you are going to be part of a steadfast church, this ought to characterize your attitude, your way of life. Isaiah chapter 50 verse 7, For the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint. Therefore have I set my face like a flint. And I know I shall not be ashamed. That means it's a church that is determined to worship God in holiness, in truth, in righteousness, and in spirit. And that church will not allow anything to sidetrack any of the members. And each member is very careful to remain steadfast on the teaching of the Word of God. Where a church is like that, setting their face as a flinch, making up their minds not to turn to the right and not to the, turn to the left. That church will be a growing church. They will refuse, like Sedrach, Meshach, and Abednego, to bow down to the idols of the world. They will say, this is where we stand, like Martin Luther of old. And in Job chapter 23, verse 11, this is a characteristic of steadfastness. Job 23, 11, my foot has held the steps. His way have I kept and not declined. Keeping the way of the Lord daily. Keeping the way of the Lord every time, in every condition, under every circumstance. And not declining from the word of his mouth. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. That is steadfastness. Steadfastness in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20. Acts, chapter 20, verse 24. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself. That's a steadfast individual. He does not allow the jesting of neighbors to move him. He does not allow the ridicule of unbelievers to move him. He does not allow the opposition of unbelievers, of sinners, to move him. He does not allow the plot and plan of uh, those who are injurious to move him. He did not allow even the weakness of other believers living around him to move him. He said, none of these things move me. And if you are going to be a steadfast member of the church of God, it means that you are not going to allow anything outside of the Bible, anything outside of God to move you. Storms may come, wind may blow, people may oppose you, but your faith is standing firm to be able to overcome. And your testimony is, the confession of your mouth says, none of these things move me, neither can I my life dear unto myself so that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. That's steadfastness. And if every member of the church will have that characteristic, that will be a steadfast church. Safe, separated, and steadfast, you're on the way to grow. And then it's a studying church. This is important. And... Uh, this you'll see characterized the church in the Bible. In Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. I'm reading over there in verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. These were not bread and butter Christians who will just come whenever you know there was something to give unto them. But they all came together to study the Bible. What do you know about a growing church? In a growing church, every member of a growing church has a personal copy of the Bible. You have your Bible there? I'll raise it up and let me see. Put them down. That's the very first step to become a part of a growing church. But you know, if you come to the church and uh, all you have in your hand is newspaper, 
And if everybody will do like yourself, you know, when we're coming to church, we just forget our Bibles at home and we just bring newspaper to the church. You will not be a growing church. But you know, when you are coming and you bring your Bible and you remove the zip on that Bible and you dust away the dust of the Bible and you begin to read it, to read it. And as you begin to read, you hear the word of God as well. Then you study the word of God. Let me help you a little. You know, we, we teach people what to do with the word of God. And you have five fingers. Your smallest finger, and we say that that finger is representing hearing the word of God. And you know, whenever you want to put any finger in the ear, that's the smallest finger you put in the ear. That's why we call it representing hearing the word of God. And this, the next finger to that is reading the word of God. And you know, if you, are, if you are just hearing and hearing and you never read it yourself, it is not complete. Remember your five fingers. You hear the word of God. The second finger, you read the word of God. And then the third finger is you study. You study. You study the word of God. The next finger is you are memorizing that word of God. You see a verse that is important. You see a verse that has ministered unto you. And you memorize that verse. And the last finger, which is the thumb, is meditating on the word of God. Now, I want you to try to hold your Bible with only two fingers. Two of your five fingers. Uh, you know, try to open, uh, hold your Bible with uh, only two of your fingers. Is it very easy? No. That means if you are using only two fingers, you are just hearing the word of God and reading the word of God, and you don't do any other thing, only reading and hearing, it will not be convenient. You will not grow. Can you try and, uh, you know, hold your Bible with only three fingers? Is it as easy as when you were holding with five fingers? No, sir. You see, if you only read and hear and study without meditating and memorizing, it is not complete. Let all the five fingers go into activity with the Bible. You hear it, you read it, you study it, you memorize it, you meditate upon it. And the steadfast church, the first church was studying about, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. In the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, they were studying the word of God. And that's what the Bible says. It says, when you are a young believer for the babes in Christ, it says, desire the sincere milk of the word of God that you may grow thereby. Look at Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. From verse 38, now it came to pass, as they went, that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, does thou not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Be that therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Master, Master, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. And Mary has chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. I am believing that you have chosen this good part, and you will not allow anybody or anything to take it away from you in Jesus' name. Amen. You see, a studying church is a growing church. A studying believer is a growing believer. And when you study the word of God, and you apply what you find in the word of God to your heart, that word of God will make you grow. And if this church will remain, as you know, we have always been doing, since the beginning of this church, we have made the emphasis that this church will be a saved church. We have made the emphasis that this church will be a separated church, separated from the things of the world. We have made the emphasis it will be a steadfast and a studying church. And as we remain like that, I believe the Lord will keep us growing in the name of Jesus. Amen. But then it's a surrendered, submissive church. If you look at this Acts chapter 2 again, verse 42. Acts Chapter 2, verse 42. And they continued steadfastly 
in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. I'm telling you that is absolute surrender. You know, they had their traditions in the past, and they were being guided and controlled by the traditions of the Jews and the traditions of the fathers. And there were many traditions they held to and superstitions they held to before they became saved or born again or before they became righteous in Christ. But do you know, immediately they became saved, immediately they were separated from the world and they became steadfast and they stood in church, they did something. They surrendered all the traditions of the past, all the superstition of the past, all the ideologies of the past. They surrendered everything and they now surrendered and submitted to the control of the word of God. And I tell you something. They were closely watching the life, the example of the apostles that were teaching them. You see, you must understand that the apostles could not teach everything they knew in only one day, or in one week, or in one month. But something that was very clear in the lives of the early believers is that they surrendered their lives to follow the examples of the apostles. And as you come here to be a surrendered member, a submissive member of the church, it means you are looking at the example of other people already believers here. I mean the example of real believers. You know, there, there may be people who have been long here, who are just coming and going out and who are not saved, who are not born again. You are not looking at those examples. You want to set an example for them, for such people who have been long here and yet they are not born again, they are not saved and li they are living a double type of life. You want to set an example for such people saying, I have just come and God has delivered me now. You get saved even though you have been long. But I'm telling you, look at the example of those who have been long in this place, who have been saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Spirit, who are praying, who are evangelizing, who are living according to the word of God. They are dependable, they are consistent, they are reading the Bible, they are studying the Bible. They are not forsaking the, uh, the assembling of ourselves together. I told you the apostles could not teach everything in one day. But these new believers were surrendered to the word of God, they were being taught, and then they were submissive to the examples they were seeing in Philippians chapter 3. Verses 16 and 17. Philippians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Nevertheless, where to we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing, brethren. Be followers together of me. The apostle said, I'm giving you the teaching and the example. Follow me. And mark them which walk as ye have us for an example. You have a zona leaders, our area leaders, our house fellowship leaders. You have, you know, our people here, members who have been longer and they're really safe and they're living challenging lives. You have them for an example. Let's walk by that example. And, uh, you know, we are told also in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Verse 6. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. And in First John chapter 2, verse 6. First John chapter 2. Verse 6, he that says he abideth in him ought himself also to walk him on as a wall. Be surrendered to the teaching of the word of God. Be submissive to the example that we are laying down for you. Examples of holiness and righteousness. Now I've told you that a growing church is a safe church. A separated church. A steadfast church. A studying church. A surrendered submissive church. Then it's a sharing church. That is, it's a church that is not selfish. An unselfish church is sharing church. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. 
The word you find there, which is uh, fellowship or in the Greek koinonia, means it's um, the interaction of believers with each other as they minister to the revealed and known needs of one another. You know, my needs, you minister to my need. I need prayer, you pray for me. You need prayer, I pray for you. Or you see a fellow brother, a fellow sister that has a material need, a physical need, you minister to that need. Or it's a social need, has no friend, it's, so, it's lonely. You minister to that, uh, to that uh, problem of loneliness. I do not allow anybody to just keep on carrying his problem alone, carrying his burden alone. You share with one another, you fellowship with one another, you pray for one another. You distribute according to the needs of uh, each individual in the church. A sharing church is a growing church. You share your faith together. You share your testimonies together. You share your property together. You share your lives together. And you minister to the revealed and known needs of one another. That was the holy church, and that's the reason they grew. It says, let me read to you again, verse 42. And they continued steadfastly. That means they were addicted to it. It was a habit for them. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship. And in breaking of bread, they ate together. And in prayers. Look at verse 44. And all that believed were together, and they had all things common. There was no selfishness at all, no self-centeredness. I, I, I has been removed by the cross of Calvary. It's crossed out. And now you are rightly related to your neighbor. You are helpful to your neighbor. You're always giving a helping hand wherever there is a need. And they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking of bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. They shared together. And that's exactly what Jesus said before he went away. He said, this is the identification mark by which people will know his church, his people, his bride, in John chapter 13. Verses 34 and 35. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, that ye love one another, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Now, your problem may be, how do I know whether I love my fellow believer or I do not? That's very simple. In First John, First John, chapter 3, Verse 17, the commandment is love one another. A growing church is a sharing church. It's a loving church. And if you love, you'll share. You'll share your very life with another person. And you may say, well, I don't know whether I am sharing or not. First John chapter 3, verse 17. But whoso has this world's good and sees his brother have need, and shortest his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but let us love in deed and in truth. That's love, sharing together. Therefore, a sharing church is a growing church, then it's a supplicating church. That means it's a church that is praying without ceasing. In Acts chapter 2, Reading that same verse 42 again, there is so much in that verse. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread, listen to this, and in prayers. And in prayers. In fact, you can go through the acts of the apostles, the very power, the supporting hand, that kept the move of the Holy Ghost in acts of the apostles is praying. Individuals pray, believers pray, 
families prayed. And when they came together as a church, they prayed. And it was a real church that was praying unto God in heaven. There was trouble for an apostle, they all prayed. A trouble for a family, they all prayed. A trouble for just somebody that came to the church, a newcomer, they all prayed. Trouble anywhere, they prayed. They prayed every time. When the church is praying, the church will be powerful. A praying church is a growing church, a joyful church, a cheerful church. A praying church is a church that will not be overcome by the devil. And so, if we want to see the growth in our individual lives, we must pray. And when it comes to corporate praying, the whole family of God praying, we must join in and pray. On Thursdays, we meet here and we do pray. We pray, we, we teach the word of God that relates to faith and healing and miracles, wonders and signs. And we come together to pray unto the Lord. And if we're going to continue to see the growth, that was seen in this church, we must still strike the note with everybody that the growth will be sustained only as we continue to pray. And therefore it was a supplicating church, but then it's also a spirit-filled church in Acts chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 38. You remember I told you before the end of last year that the Holy Ghost was poured upon the 120 disciples that were waiting. And immediately these others were to be brought into the church. They were told of the privilege and opportunity they had. Verse 38, And Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of, of sins. Listen to this. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they promised the son to you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And do you know? Immediately these three thousand came into the church. The great concern in the hearts of the apostles is how they will be filled with the Holy Ghost. And as we have come into the church, it should be a great concern in our heart and in your heart. A great concern in the heart of the sonar leader, area leader, house leader, in the, in the heart of every worker. How everyone that has come into the church will be filled with the Holy Ghost. But you understand that uh, you get saved first and then you get sanctified and after that you are ready to be filled with the Holy Ghost. It was a spirit filled, a spirit led, a spirit controlled church. Such a church will grow. And then it's, uh, it was a church that had signs following them. Jesus had left the promise in Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. Reading over there from verse 17. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take off serpents. If they drink any deadly sin, shall not hurt them. They shall lay their hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And he went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord walking with them and confirming the word with signs following. In faithfulness to the promise that Jesus had given them, this church had signs, wonders, miracles, following them. In Acts chapter 2, verse 43. Acts chapter 2, verse 43. And fear came upon every soul. That means a great reverence or respect for that church and for the God moving mightily in that church came upon everybody. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. That's the secret of growth for a church. And maybe you're asking, why is this church growing? I'm telling you, it's because, number one, it's a saved church. We put the emphasis on the fact that ye must be born again because that is the very emphasis of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it's a separated church. We encourage every member of this church not to be conformed together with the world, but to be separated and not to touch the unclean sin, to be honest in a dishonest society. Then it's a steadfast church. We encourage every member to come on Sunday, come on Monday, come on Thursday, go to all fellowship, be steadfast, follow the Lord, worship the Lord. 
in time of temptation, contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. When false uh, doctrine peddled, peddlers, when they come around, reject false doctrine. And because we are steadfast in contending for the faith, that's why we're growing. We're studying church. The Bible is the center of our fellowship. We're surrendered, submissive church. Our people are obedient to the word of God in the majority. We're sharing church. We share our lives and share our property and share our love and share our faith and share everything we have with one another. And because of that, we're growing together. We're supplicating church. We pray every time we come together. We pray in our houses. We pray in our families. We pray even when two believers meet together. Any place where they meet, they pray. And because they're supplicating, sharing church, that's why we're growing. Of course, we encourage every member to immediately get holy, sanctified. Be purified after they are saved. Now after you are sanctified, be pure with the Holy Ghost. Of course, such a church will grow. And then signs are following. The miracles are there. The sick are getting healed. Incurable diseases are going away. Just like the early church, many wonders and signs are being done by our minister said. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Which... As the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. And I give you this as, you know, the last note. A growing church is a soul winning church. Look at the very last verse, verse 47. Praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily, such as shall be saved. You see, where every member has got saved, and every saved member has gone out to teach other people, instruct other people, invite other people, pray with other people, and lead them to the experience and knowledge of Jesus as Savior. That will be a growing church. And uh, my question to you is, as you are joining and you are becoming part of this church, studying the Bible with us, and now you want to be identified with this body of believers, I'm informing you, you are joining a growing church. And you want to make sure that you are a good member of this growing church. And the question I'm asking you is, are you saved? Are you separated from the world? Are you steadfast? Are you making up your mind? Setting your face as a flint to follow the Lord all the days of your life and never to compromise or backslide? Are you dedicating yourself to the study of the Word of God, a studying believer? Are you going to be surrendered and submissive to the Word of God? Are you going to share your very life, your very life, your very life with your wife, with your husband, with every believer? Are you going to be a supplicating individual, making your supplications and prayers known unto God? Are you going to be spirit-filled and spirit-led and spirit-controlled? Are you going to allow the signs to follow you? Are you going to be a soul-winning member? Well, if we all do this, we'll keep on growing. And I believe we'll do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we'll rise up and we'll tell the Lord, if you are not saved, you yield yourself to the Lord, you confess your sins to the Lord and you get saved. If you are saved,